Uh, so thanks for sticking around for, for the final talk in the miscellaneous section. We should sort of package our talks together, put it in the NuGet package, and call it common utils or something like that. Um, so my name is Einar. I work uh, as an architect for a software company called Nullcart. And what I want to do with this talk is to share an observation with you, um, a pattern that I think is pretty common in the indus indus industry. And uh, I've invented a name for it, uh, which is uh, the notion of tech debt nomads and slash and burn development. Uh, and the purpose of having a name for it is that we can talk about it, right? And see if this is a real thing. Uh, so the pattern looks like this. Uh, this is the slash and burn loop. And the person in the, uh, in the middle is uh, the yellow stick figure is the tech lead on the team. Now, for whatever reason, uh, this happens. The tech lead decides to leave. Uh, maybe it's not as much fun as it used to be. Or maybe they got a new job offer. Or maybe they just decided to do something else. So out they go. And of course, when the tech lead leaves, you need to replace them. So the new tech lead is brought in, and this is the first step of the loop. This is called a replacement. Now what happens when you've replaced your tech lead is um, that the new tech lead immediately discovers that things are not well with the code. Um, it is complicated, and it's dirty, and it's old-fashioned, and it's riddled with technical debt, and all the bad things that we can uh, all the bad sort of words we can use to characterize code, it's practically un impossible to understand anything and you can't get anything done. And this triggers uh, the second phase of the slash and burn loop, which is the big tech lead rewrite. And this can take a couple of months. Uh, it looks a bit, little bit look like this, perhaps. Um, uh, but something must be done. There's no way around it, right? Um, and since the team has been through a sort of a crisis and it's this transition phase, Stakeholders are typically a little bit more forthcoming um, and offers the team uh, more, uh, a greater degree of freedom than they might otherwise have under normal circumstances. Of course, it's not possible to rewrite everything you have in your backlog, so the tech lead will typically choose something, some token project that they can use to establish this new level of excellence uh, to inspire uh, the rest of the team. And this is the standard that we're going to be working uh, uh, with going forward. But of course, eventually the team will need to revert to normal development, right? So the token rewrite must either be done or declared done, uh, and arguably this is when sort of the, the real replacement phase is over, right? And of course, there are still large parts of the system that the tech lead are, isn't happy about, but at least you have this pet system now, uh, which is a source of pride. But then time passes, right? And eventually, after a couple of years, this disenchantment uh, st starts setting in. Everything is kind of slow again. Um, even the new stuff that this tech lead introduced with great urgency uh, suffers from some drawbacks. It has accumulated some technical debt of its own. And some people are starting to question, was this really a good idea in the first place? Uh, so the tech lead starts feeling a little bit misunderstood and unappreciated and stuff like that. And eventually, these thoughts start creeping in that maybe it's time to move on, right? Maybe move to some other place where their ideas uh, will be more appreciated and uh, they will have a better chance of forming the system to their vision. So, and we're back at replacement and the loop is complete. And this process, from my experience, takes roughly three years on average, right? So this is under slash and burn, burn loop. Now if you zoom out, you might see a pattern that's something like this. There's not just one loop, there's a lot of loops. And you have these tech leads acting as these tech debt nomads, basically going from loop to loop, uh, setting fire to some system, rebuilding it to their image, and then after a couple of years, you abandon it and move on. Uh, and the good thing is maybe someone will torch that, and or, well, I don't know. So is this good or bad? Well, I, nothing is ever good or bad, right? So it's a little bit of both. We'll take a look at some upsides and some downsides. Well, a good thing is that it does enable some sort of like dissemination of skill, experience, and know-how. Uh, I don't think anyone wants a completely static arrangement where no one ever changes jobs. Right? That would be much worse than this nomad pattern. Uh, it enables a kind of partial renewal, which is useful because we live in this pop industry and our tech stacks get obsolete really quickly. So it's good that we have some process in place for replacement. Of course, it's not always the things that we really need to be replaced, uh, to replace that are replaced. Typically, something that's easy to replace is replaced instead. 
But anyway, that's, that's at least partially good. And of course, rewriting is also uh, a way to take ownership, and that's also good. Um, on the downside, um, the organization loses a lot of domain knowledge, system knowledge, and history, which when, when, whenever people leave. So when you have a central person in your team leaving every th three years, you have a giant knowledge leak. Right? And some of that knowledge will have to be rediscovered, and some of, some of it will just be forgotten. It's very wasteful, and also, and this is, uh, I guess, a problem, is that you are trying to reshape the system when you don't really know the domain or the problem that well yet, right? So this is when you know the least about the problem, right? And you make, uh, may make some poor choices. And finally, it enables uh, some harmful narratives, I think, about software development, what matters in software development. The first is this sort of like hero mentality, right? So success in uh, software is about the individual skill, right? And it goes hand in hand with this self-serving bias that we tend to attribute whenever things go well with us, it's because we're really awesome. And if it doesn't go so well, it's because of the environment. But when you talk about other people, it's the other way around, right? So, so that's not so healthy. Uh, and there's also this idea of techno-solutionism, which basically means that uh, we believe that the magic of new technology it's going to make all our problems disappear. So wherever it is that is ailing us, we can fix it by changing the framework, changing the database, um, changing from one kind of cloud service to another, uh, maybe sp taking your monolith and splitting it into microservices, or taking your microservices and merging them into a monolith. Or basically, uh, whatever is like in the assessed phase in the tech raider this year, right? So if you stick with these narratives, you risk being what's called an expert beginner. Right, so you're just living the same three years of experience over and over, and you just try harder with the same approach, which is a, sh a shame, I think. So, what are some causes for this pattern? Uh, I guess you could say it's complicated, which is what we tend to say when there's more than one cause and it's really this systemic problem. Um, first is really economic pressure, right? So it actually it makes a lot of sense to move every now and then, because that's the best way to get a higher salary, so it makes economic sense on the individual level. It's a way to build your resume. That makes sense. There are also like these broader cultural reasons. Uh, I think we have sort of like this change fetish, right? So we are taught that change in and of itself is good, and things remaining the same is bad, even though when we zoom out, we might see that this changing, we're stuck in this loop with superficial changes, right? And there's also a tremendous pressure in the industry of urgency, a pressure to produce, and I think Agile also has contributed to this, that everything um, needs to happen really yesterday, and this unfortunately gives rise to short-term focus. Uh, and then there are the psychological reasons, and I touched about the, on this uh, with the narratives. But being a nomad helps greatly with cognitive dissonance, right? So just when the consequences of your choices are starting to make themselves felt, you decide that it's move, time to move on, right? And that means you can uphold the image in your head that all your technical and architectural choices were sound, right? And problems can be explained away by external factors, or you didn't have the mandate to, to finish the big rewrite, right? And this allows you to preserve your heroic self-image. So if you consider this to a problem, what should you do? If you want to sort of destroy your heroic self-image and do something else, um, well, first of all, there is no universal solution to this, right? Uh, aside from like a massive cultural shift that sort of invalidates all these causes, uh, there's not going to be a universal uh, fix for this. But you could have um, individual solutions, right? Uh, well, I think this pattern, I argue that this pattern is prevalent in the industry. It's not the only reality out there, right? So you can have different realities. In fact, it's very, very easy. So if you find yourself being a tech debt nomad today, right, you can break out of the cycle just by staying, right? Stay for the duration of two cycles instead of one. So instead of staying in the same job for three years, you stay for six years. And then something magical happens because you're staying with the disenchantment. And this enchantment is the bitter seed of growth, because then you sort of have to, to deal with it. Right? You can, it's a great trigger for reflection. You have to really start thinking about why are we in this mess, and can we come up with some, some better um, explanation than just everyone else is an idiot, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's going to be some uh, mixture of these things. Uh, 
okay, the environment's going to have an uh, impact, so the constraints that you operate under is going to have an impact. The priorities that were made both by you and by someone else are going to have, have an impact. The trade-offs that were made and the assumptions that you made. And some of these you have full control over, some of them you might influence, some of them you might, uh, maybe you had the poss possibility to influence but you didn't, and so on and so forth. And then there are going to be some things that are out of control and that's okay. But it's important, if we're going to learn anything uh, and learn different narratives, we have to feel the pain of our own choices, right? And we have to own that pain. It's our pain, right? No one can take them away, uh, that away from us. Uh, and we need to learn to paint ourselves out of a corner. We've learned in this industry to paint ourselves into corners really quickly, right? Uh, but we need a way to get out of it again uh, and, and a better approach to do that than by setting fire to things. We want to adopt healthier narratives. Uh, first, there are no heroes, we are not heroes, but we do have agency, and we have agency even beyond just the typing of code. It's important that we learn to think in long term um, uh, so that uh, we don't paint ourselves into these corners. Uh, so we need to learn to be good custodians, and it's also important for the day that you decide to move on. So what are the things that you're gonna bring with you when you move to a new job? Is it going to be this thing, or is it going to be something more constructive? Thank you. <laughs>